right, let's get it started with as an official intro as you're ever going to get. This is the Pill Pod featuring me, as well as Eric Tate. I hope not and alleged me. to be a sex trafficker. Tate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Victor Brazone and today to break down the myths of, well, I'm not sure which myths we're going to get to, but mythologizing the myth himself, Diego <laughs> Rosarin. Oh my God! Does that mean I'm I'm an empty signifier? Fuck off, Bill. That was that was that was a, that was uncalled for uh, violence. Uh, no, no, you're the the fullest signifier here. Don't worry. Not to spoil the ending, but if we take Bart seriously, there's there is no leftist media possible in a bourgeois society. So we are all myths, insofar as we're entertaining at all. Or is or is he saying the left is a myth? We'll we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to it. Before we do, I want to do some family family history since Victor just signed into the call. You guys are both from South America, and both yeah. have Italian surnames. How did right. this happen? Because Mussolini was running away from persecution, so we, <laughs> so he has to slightly alter his last name, and I became Rusarini. Wait, did it used to be Rusarini or no? Or, or no, is it... in in Italian, where you add the I to the end, you make it plural. Oh, okay. So the I is for plural. So it's like uh, Gonzales, Gonzalo, Rusarin, Rusarini. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Got it. So what? Your it. family came in the 30s. My family came slightly before. No, to, uh, it, is, it, it doesn't match with the uh, with the Second World War, even the rise of fascism before that. My my family came to Brazil around the early 1900s. My my grandfather was the first one to be born in Brazil, and he was born in 1905. Do you have any yeah, idea my wh why? Why? Uh, they were looking for opportunities in agriculture. Oh, farmers. Oh, cool. yeah, farmers. Yep. What about you, Victor? Yeah, my gr my great grandfather would have been on my dad's side. Would have been born in Italy, um, mm. and then my grandfather was yeah also similarly. I think the first one born in Chile. I could be wrong, but I think that's right. And then I think that he, my great grandfather, met another Chile a Chilean woman who was also of Italian descent, Rocco, whose last name was Rocco, and uh, mm. and then but that's the only like it's just one quarter of my family that's actually Italian. Just happens to be my dad's dad's side because like the other side of my dad's family is german mm -hmm. uh and then like and then the other side and then my mom is like spanish and french and other mm -hmm. stuff and and indigenous I think, Ger Chilean I think german too. and italian are actually the two most common uh ascendances in in latin america my family it's is truly italian eh? yeah i just did the genetic uh, oh mapping. really yeah and i'm 94 italian which is ridiculous oh wow very <laughs> yeah. italian yeah no i think I, I did my genetics too and i think i'm only like I'm only like 7% Italian, but also like 20 something percent, like broadly Southern European. So some of that is probably Italian too. They just like couldn't really match it up, but yeah, they came, uh, so they, they would have come, I think in the, in the early 20th century, or he would have come. And I think they were just looking for opportunities. They were actually all professionals. I remember my dad always talked about how his grandparents, there was like seven or nine Brazoni grandparents and they Somewhere. were all like professionals, like pharmacists, doctors. My grandfather was a doctor. So I think um, I think I think yeah. Pills asked us this because he wants to right now impossibilitate us from using the fallacy of authority to speak about the myth of fascism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we're sk skipping ahead. We'll see the death of the author. But... Mm, <laughs> exactly. That's a sneaky plan. I do. I will say that on the German side of my dad's family, the, none of them came like they all arrived before World War II, but. Like some of my dad's uncles who were German were like in the Hitler youth in, in like, uh, in Chile, in like South America. Like they were, they were into it. They were like supporters. And I remember going to, uh, visit one of these great uncles in Miami. Cause he moved to Miami and I remember finding it funny. It's like of all the places they like to be like a Jew hater, like going to Miami. I don't know. It's like, it's just like, <laughs> oh my God. And I remember my dad, my dad once like told him, cause my dad really liked the golden girls, that sitcom. And he like asked him, he was like, maybe you might need to cut this out. He was just like, he was like, the golden girls takes place in Miami. It's great. Right. And my great uncle was just like, they're all Jews. <laughs> my God. <laughs> unnecessary wow. racism. That's yeah. Just so unnecessary. My dad was like, what? Okay. That's yeah. But of yeah. all the reasons to <laughs> hate, of all the reasons to hate the golden girls, that's the one you pick. That's what you're going I know. For. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> has this one, one of the myths that we can talk about, and, and this is, this is interesting because it contrasts the idea of the myth from Barthes with Zizek is the myth of the Jew. Oh, yeah, that would be interesting to talk about, actually, because I am I did find myself throughout the whole time we've been reading Bars and this mythology stuff. I've, I've I just couldn't stop thinking about like, OK, how is this different from 
Zizek's ideology or mm-hmm. like so so if we can get there I'd be I would be interested. Well, I yeah. can start it and then I assume Diego will will take over cuz that's what, <laughs> why we have him here. <laughs> Um, we are talking about myth, as has been mentioned. Uh, we did two episodes already. We did the automobile myth, Diego, mm. last last week. Uh, thanks um, for asking me, man. We are- fuckers. <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for the invitation. <laughs> we just watched. We watched car commercials. We thought that was beneath you. Oh so. my god, you guys! You guys. Well, let's <laughs> review. We're going to get to myths on the left myths on the right myth is depoliticized speech yet paradoxically all of our politics is mythical yeah so if we review quickly we're reading roland bart mythologies from 1957 myth is a type type of speech and it's not something ancient that's one of his main points is that dead myths are not myths a myth is always contemporaneous and uh i guess this is Notable because our age is no less mythological than the old savage times. And I'd like to say more and more people are are, are saying this, you know, they agree with it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. If he's right, media runs on myth, politics, at least fake politics runs on myth, advertising runs on myth, and myth, Oof. not just like something false, but myth as a meaning structure or the meaning structure that makes it hard to uh, tell what's going on. So we're doing some semiology semiotic yeah and and there's it's significant that it's a type of speech too because um in in semiology is so sir conceived of it right long language long and speech are almost like separated from one another right so the the semiologist is interested in long which long. is the uh sign signifier distinction right so the the sign is a two-sided psychological entity the acoustic impression is the signifier and that is associated the association is important with also with a signified which is the concept or the mental impression um so speech is speech as you know like a word that is actually spoken would be decomposed or or formalized let's say in this schema of signifier signified whereas speech um if myth is a type of speech then there's already like a fullness of meaning there when we use words in everyday speech we're tapping on these meanings that Hmm. you can sort of study semiologically Um, but then myth has to add this extra layer to give it its own kind of second level semiological analysis, right? So these spoken, it can be spoken word, verbal, pictorial. It doesn't really have to be speech, but the point is that it's parole, it's speech, it's posit- It's a positive entity that we would encounter in a commercial or in everyday conversations sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah in case you didn't pick up, Eric's writing a dissertation on semiology <laughs> in this book what 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 becomes signs he talks about soap commercials he talks about car commercials he talks about wrestling yeah, fashion campaigns awesome. and all of this is uh i think we should get a counter going for how many times we say the word bourgeoisie today because <laughs> the mythic <laughs> structure in which he lived and we still live is a bourgeois mythic structure and this this is kind of a, a whole new wave of, of of semiologists in the in the mid century trying to privilege speech a little more in in linguistic analysis, right? So that's why you know linguistics will deal with speech as language, whereas meta linguistics will deal with speech as mythology or as myth or as as meta language. Hmm. So for this meta language, which Myth is also a meta language. You need meta linguistics, a second order critique of meta language. Yeah, of, of what myth does, which is naturalize history. Uh, that's that's the function of myth. It makes it makes the contingent and the historical appear to be natural and eternal. That that for me, that last sentence for me, Eric, is is probably the most interesting one out of the out of the full reading because it connects back to a lot of things that will help us understand why he calls the left and the right also a myth 
And um, I think that statement, uh, what what Eric said, which is very important to me, but I want to get there first. Can I make like a recap? And because I read it in Spanish finally, and I want to, I want, I just want to make sure I'm using the same language as you guys. Because for example, you said ac acoustic image is for the relationship between signifier and signify. They produce an acoustic language, and the acoustic image is the sign, right? Uh, the the acoustic image is the signifier as as the form. It's the form of the impression of okay. the of the uh, of the phonetic part. Right, of because the in, sign. in Spanish is weird. In Spanish is imagen verbal. This is, is like is verbal image, which is mm. I think it's is very similar. I just wanted to make sure we're referring to the same thing. Right. So in Espanol it will be el significante y el significado, which is interesting because when you yeah. use it in speech, it makes it so easy for us to understand the position of those two, uh, let's say, elements in, in discourse. So there's a thing that is being signified and there is something that is doing the action of signifying. So it's the signifier, right? Yes. So the sig so the signifier is referring to that which is being signified in, in discourse. But then one, one thing that is important here and I, I always come back I, and always end up coming back to this text is um, be um, about truth and uh, lies in an extra moral sense from Nietzsche. And uh, he talks about this process that we normally do in language that is a double metaphor, right? So, so we have this phenomenological experience of the world, which produces um, metaphorical experience of the world, which then becomes in a way imaginary. And then that, that imaginary is transformed to the symbolical order. And in this in this transition, not from not from the real world to the imaginary, but from the imaginary to the symbolic, is when we are talking about the relationship between signified and signifiers. Because the signifier is not necessarily making reference to the real world; it's making reference to the concept of the real world, right? So th that that is already one degree of metaphorization that we're not talking about the thing in itself. We are we are referring to that abstract shared notion of the thing in itself which will be the commonplace in Aristotelian rhetoric. And then that's something that we're referring to is being signified by the signifier. But the problem is that what, what he's saying is that as, as language normally evolves, decomposes and finds new relationships, this sign that is the result of the relationship between the signified and the signifier, this sign now becomes only a signifier that then is being used as, no, it becomes a signified that is being used as a for a different signifier to create a new myth. So that's the second level of the of the relationship. Am I right? Yeah, you got yeah, levels he... of reality, if you want to call it that. And real reality doesn't appear in the system, even yeah, with so sir. Like the signified, yeah. the signified, you call it concept. I think you could call it like a mental image would, would make sense. The thing the that you're referring to. And then myth raids regular speech, regular language, which is our day-to-day -day negotiations that are engaged with material stuff. The myth takes those words and then repurposes them for what are usually political ends by depoliticizing the actual language. Yeah, yeah. And 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 Bart does notice, you know, this signifier signified structure is quite popular, right? So, mm. you know, Freud has a version of it too. So when you're talking linguistics, right? Signifier is the acoustic image. Signified is the the concept, right? And as Diego pointed out, the signified isn't the thing. It's it's simply the 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 mental impression, the concept, the yep. associated meaning with the signifier. So you know, the signifier can have many signified. Signified can have many signifiers. Whatever linguistics, right? But in Freud, you have the manifest meaning, say, mm -hmm. of a dream. Uh, and you have the latent meaning. That would be, again, there's a signifier signified pair. And f the whole dream work would be like the, the third term here, I guess, would be the sort of whole. But the meaning is the latent meaning of your dream, your parapraxis, your neurosis, whatever, whatever you want to think about. And whatever, whatever psychoanalysis is being interested in there. Yeah, you have that. There, there's a lot of this sort of signifier signified structure going on in theory at this time. Yeah. And still, so, still is. So at the level of the myth, the signifier that creates the mythology is referring to the signified that was also a signifier before. So it creates a, it creates a chain dependence. In that sense, it creates a meta language because all, um, all mythology is based upon this notion that the original signified is missing. And it's only implied in the form of the relationship of the original signifier that is now taking the place of the signified in the new mythology. 
This would be helpful if we could pr make diagrams. Yeah. Or examples. I have these pictures up or in examples. front of me. <laughs> examples so, yeah. would be helpful. I was going to say too, like for the listener, maybe you yeah. should just play a drinking game and drink every time you hear signify or signify. signify. I feel like you'd, yeah, you'd, there's you'd another already one. be oh fucking God. wasted. Well, the, you, an easy way to put it would be with advertising, <laughs> right? Advertising, there are objects that it's selling. There's soap. Soap has a purpose. It has a it's a sign in language that you would use like, hey, can you pass me the soap? I don't know I don't know when you would say, Hey, can you pass me the soap? But you might. But in then prison. the soap in the commercial becomes Please not in prison. Please not in prison. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The soap in the commercial, the way that it's depicted with these illustrations and animations, it becomes this purging element. It seeks out it's intelligent in a way. It seeks out dirt to destroy it. It seeks out bacteria to eliminate it. So the sign or the mythical sign of soap, and you could apply this to any advertisement. We did cars last week. The car is this sign of freedom and unrestraint, which is why it's always shown in the wilderness. It's shown as a sign of uh, class mobility in terms of like a luxury car versus a, a family car. So each of these has a whole bunch of, it, it enters the myth matrix and has all these associations that aren't natural to it but they appear as natural to it essential universalized and, and, and perpetual there's also a very cool example with for example margarine you know like margarine mar margarine Mar I margarine know, yeah, yeah margarine okay so margarine is a substitute for butter and what is interesting here is that the 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 mythology of margarine is using the sign signifier of the vaccine because, for example, in vaccines, we know you get injected with a virus, but with a smaller doses of the virus, so your body will develop a resistance. So the virus itself is not evil, it's the quantity of evilness mm. that determines if something <laughs> is good or bad. And margarine uses the signifier mythology of the vaccine to sell itself as a good alternative to butter. <laughs> so you see, it, it, it naturalizes it naturalizes the logic of the vaccine. The body will develop natural resistance to a small quantity of negativeness. And it and it takes that logic out of context, compete, completely naturalize it, essentialize it, make it eternal and non-contingent, and applies to the logic of a margarine co commercial. Yeah, that's funny. You know, margarine originally wasn't even, uh, like that was a marketing ploy to make it an alternative to butter because margarine originally was made from like a beef tallow. It, oh, was yeah. like a, it was like a meat margarine thing. Margarine will kill you. Yeah. No, and it was like it was originally like a totally different thing, and people liked it for different reasons. And then I think marketers got their hands on it, and they're like, "Well, we can try to, you know, sell a plant based one, and then and then like yeah, the the canola oil version, and make it an alternative." Even though actually, I think it's actually worse. <laughs> I, I don't know if you can find it. You, you, we can even put it on screen. But there's four levels of denial with the relationship of humans, marketing, and margarine, mm -hmm. which is like, is this butter? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's butter. And then I cannot believe it's butter. Oh my God, it's butter. And, there, and those, those are all real brands. Huh? Those yeah, are yeah, all exactly. real brands of margarine. Yeah, we have one called I can't believe it's not butter. <laughs> yeah. exactly. exactly. And they all refer to the to the mythology of not believing that something is what it is not, what is denying or something like a like a negative dialectic of affirmation. It's so, it's so strange. Diego, you used to work in food marketing, didn't you? In a, in a former life? Yeah, I used to lie all the time. I used to work in advertising too, but it wasn't lying so much as it was omitting certain truths. But <laughs> yeah, you are here then as a professional myth maker. Yes, you're a yeah, myth maker, this, yeah. And, and it, it, was, it was very interesting for me to read this book because I found a lot of examples like super obvious. And it makes sense that marketing is the language of mythology and is also the language of bourgeoisie. Because what, what, what I would like to take the conversation now is in the direction of, um, I think, I think what Roland Barthes is trying to do is that he's trying to some way push for a materialistic theory of language. Hmm. Because what, what he implies later on in the reading is that the, the proletariat, the worker, which has nature in hand, you know, has the tree in front of him, is actually referring to the tree in hand. See, he's actually, when he talks about a tree, yes. he's referring to the Speaks tree. Speaks the tree, as he puts exactly. it. Yeah. Yeah. But when, when you step away from the tree and you refer to the tree in an abstract way, then you're talking about, about the tree and on the tree. But not, not, the tree is not there itself. The tree is not being named. It's the absence of the tree that's being named. So in a way, the further you get from material reality, the closer you are to myth. 
The yeah. closer you are to meta language that is almost becoming like this autonomous being, non-materialistic. And it also makes a lot of sense that his criticism is that mythology is essentialized and non-contingent. And what we should be aiming for in demystifying mythology is to find the material root in the functioning of language. That, yeah. That, that's why uh, we'll, we'll, when we get to politics, I will get back to this point. But that's why I, I love his his analysis of the mythology of the left and the mythology of the right. Oh, that's a really good way in. Yeah. Can I can I can yeah. I come in with like an annoying question? Just like my continued confusion <laughs> with this material. Like I just I just feel like I find myself. Yeah, just like reading through this um, and feeling like like why is the word that we're using myth? I guess like I, I know I kind of asked in a previous episode, how is this different from a kind of Al Althusserian ideology or like a, a kind of Lacanian account of like the imaginary and the symbolic? It's just like I don't know. It just annoys me. I think when when like certain kinds of academic writers or theorists kind of use a term that seems to have. Um, one meaning and then kind of like reimagines it to, to apply to just so many things, almost oh everything. Oh my God, Victor. Perfect question. Well, I think because it's the relationship. It, it has a question of contemporaneity too, because we don't use the word myth like mm -hmm. this really. But yeah. he right. was okay, so that a mean lie he or was falsehood. He was contemporaneous with Althusser and Lacan. So I guess it, the term ideology or the imaginary kind of won was out. Taken. <laughs> they seem better to me. Well, you have to understand, because they're contemporaneous, they're not necessarily reading each other at this time. So they're different traditions that are interacting. Like Althusser is a neo-Marxist and Lacan a psychoanalyst. So it all goes back to Saussure eventually. And they're not exactly talking about precisely the same things. But Barth, as a linguist, is talking about myth in the same sense as it would have been used to deconstruct an ancient myth. So you have linguistics. You have psychoanalysis and you have neo-Marxism that are all drawing on these resources in structuralism in from Saussure. And then they come up with different terms with a bunch of overlap, but they're disciplinary or they're disciplinarily different from each other. But, but like, you know, know the so relationship so is, 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 does myth in French mean something different though? I guess that was going to be my question. Cause like, maybe that's yeah. the issue, right? Cause like, I feel like myth mythology, cause mythology is just like precisely not like in kind of the, the, the common sense English way of using that term. It really would mean the opposite of something that is used to conceal like my the friend, fact that something's not real. Right. It's actually you're, like, you're trying, you're trying to essentialize language and the relationship between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. It could <laughs> no, no, be but I'm not, anyway. I, don't think, I don't think I'm essentializing. I'm actually just saying that like, I'm kind of stating a common sense, like that it's used in this way. That doesn't mean common that that's sense. the essential meaning. That's common not the, sense is also something that he well, refers to when talking about the myth of the right. But I think that that's, but I think that that's totally consistent with like a, a with a Wittgensteinian view of language, which is non-essentializing, right? That meaning is use, right? And like words are used in this way. You can make that observation. Oh, right? you got to so, think that the common sense okay. would be the idiot, like the common sense status quo would be a kind of ideological state of affairs, right? So it doesn't really matter what people think is the truth behind the things that myth or language is telling them in a way but i mean so is myth I think the same the, the, as language you just said myth or language is that just are they just the same thing well language no as i explained earlier right like when we, we should reserve the word language for long and that's what linguists like so sir are interested in they're interested in long right language not speech speech is something that language has to be has to be abstracted from right and then language it turns out is is a two-sided affair right right has the signifier signified but we we don't work that way in every day right the 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 example from last week i i bring you a bouquet of roses to signify my passion for you you have a sign in front of you you don't have a signifier with a like those are formal terms right you have a sign in front of you i and i'm using this this sign is signifying my passion the sign is the bond between the signifier signified it's the positive entity that you would actually encounter in any real situation you don't encounter signifiers signifiers come out of our theory our, our formal analysis right and that's how we get a handle on the language system but when we want to look at this second order system right we can go in two ways right we can look at ideological critique we can look at the ways that 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 ideology works with common sense in order to close 
language off, right? To 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 center and close language, right? So the we'll talk about this sort of bourgeois ideology and and how myth functions in in a political sense. But then on the other side, you have meta language, which is not. It kind of works against ideology in a way, in that it is transgressive. It takes something, as Barth does. You take something, you take a commercial, and you and you read it against itself. You try to look at the historical meaning. This is the materialist part, by the way. Historical materialism, ideology critique, right? You try to look at what is the meaning that has been emptied out of this, right? So using a, a black soldier to signify French imperialism. Well, what is the history that's being flattened out here? What is the involvement of 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 black people in French colonialism being recruited to the army? Even this specific person who I'm seeing in this ad, who is it? What is their past? Like all whatever, all these questions, they're kind of held in abeyance, right? They're held at a distance by the by the mythic signifier, right? It doesn't care about those things. What it cares about is finding a concept, right? Uh, appropriating a, a concept to that signifier, which is you know, French imperialism. Letting you know that French imperialism is a kind of natural thing and look how good it is, right? It like anybody can kind of get on board with it. Right? I mean, I get all that. I, I I get all like I get what what it's pointing to i just I'm trying to figure out like what what the work of calling it myth is doing right because you know he says uh, i was looking at it you know he describes how it abolishes complexity of human acts it gives simplicity of essences it does away with all dialectics it goes back to what is immediate and visible like i guess because to me when i think of myth i think about i don't know like greek mythology or something like that right it's like these stories that are full of contradictions that are just like stories that we know aren't true so it's just like why use the word myth to describe what to me sounds a lot more like ideology or i don't know i mean maybe well, that's well, an I interesting think, point but myth... to me like as someone who's trying to learn this stuff i'm like what is the what is the word myth doing to, to give some analytical clarity to make me learn something or think about the world in a new way and i'm not seeing it yet well in a way the word myth is is the ancient greek word for speech so okay. It's a so there were, so myth, we're going back myth to and like um... mythos and logos, right? Mythos and logos, right? Mythos means by mouth, right? It means spoken. It means speech. Right, That's what right. mythos okay. means, right? That's like literally where we get our word mouth from. Okay, well that answers my question. I mean, I was just looking for Whereas whereas it's opposed to words like logos, right? As in say logocentrism as Derrida uses it or logos just to mean logic or 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 reasoning, right? It's it's opposed to that. It, it it's just a, it's a signifier he's chosen to, uh, and, and in the same way that the Greeks had their myths, they're culturally unifying. They reappropriate signs from language. They turn it into something else. Everything is a sign. Like you see a, you see a bird, um, flying with a snake in its talons. This is a sign that we can now go attack Troy on the on the following day because the gods are blessing us. So in the same and way, they didn't that, call their myths myths. They called right. them songs. Well, well I almost I almost them. thought you were gonna show the uh, that you were talking about the Mexican thing, the bird with a snake uh, in its mouth or something, right on the cactus, or something like that. That's, yeah, that's a cool myth. Yeah. Well, yeah, no. When when Agamemnon like s has to sacrifice his daughter or something, there's uh there's there's a sign like that. What is interesting about this is that what we, th this discussion that we had is the mythologist job. In the sense that the, the mythologist's job is to bring historical and material contingency to the relationship between how a sign becomes a myth mm. and unnaturalize the relationship between a sign and the mythology that is created with the relationship between the sign and the new signifier that uses only the sign as a relationship of form. To unravel that naturalization of myth is to do the mythology's work, is to, is to prove that that relationship is historical, contingent, material, social, and dependent on historical, political relationships of, of human, human endeavors. That's the job of the mythologer, according to me. Which also kills the myth. Exactly. But that's, if you, if you are, because he's a uh, leftist and r railing on the bourgeoisie, this whole book, but yeah. the, the point of killing the myth is to, take away its naturalized power to convince yeah. and to sway and to, you know, use soap commercials to have you <laughs> believe in a cosmic war between good and evil in your products. Why? Because in a, in a way we have to, we have to place, we have to talk about where do we place language 
Is it part of the superstructure or, or is part of the base, material base? Because if we place language or la langue closer to the superstructure, then it means on, on dialectical materialism that language itself, it's nothing but um, a manifestation of social structures and social relationships, which function is to perpetuate the basis that produces it. So of course, myth is going to be a self-perpetuating meta, meta language because the role of the superstructure is to perpetuate the material basis that produces them. And the job of the mythologist and the critique of ideology and what Zizek is trying to do to invert uh, Hegel back to Lacan back to Hegel is that what he's trying to do is to find again what are those material bases through politics, through politics that is not present in myths that produces the possibility for meta language to dominate uh, discourse. Yeah, I, I almost think of myth myth as well as almost um it doesn't line up perfectly but it's almost like the decay of the aura in benjamin when he mm. talks about you know the presence of the mountains and or like tracing the lines on the bow of the tree that you're kind of lying in front of on a sleepy day right you're you're kind of breathing in the aura of the thing it's unique it's it's there yeah. in front of you it's that it's not over a great distance there's one of them whereas the decay of the aura in copying and reproductive technologies right that that destroys the aura and it and it makes the thing infinitely reproducible and, Doesn't Bart say something like uh, it, it meets, becomes quasi or pseudo natural to hide the fact that it's anti natural? Yeah, it's kind of like a re aura ing. <laughs> like it, mm. it re establishes the aura in a certain way in this context of the decay of the aura, because clearly Barthes is talking about mass media culture here. Uh, it's like almost that the way that. Mass media almost works against Benjamin's thesis that like the aura is going to be gone and it's just going to be the ma mass media for the masses and not kind of against the masses. Uh, this is the way that mass media works back against that and pushes capitalism and, and bourgeois back into the center again is that it it mythologizes, it, it mm. reconstitutes the aura around these language objects that are turned into empty forms. Right, and are. it does it differently as well because he says the capital part of the capitalist myth is replacing quality with quantity, mm. that reproduction yeah, I mean, oh, over and over yeah, again, and then the, So it's yeah. a, it's the same reproduction, but the 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 notion of elevating quantity and more matters better more than like the quality of quality. workmanship is something that ben, Benjamin would have said. Yeah. yeah, like and, fake food, right? You think you think in those commercials, oh, that looks so good. No, it's fucking fake. It's meant to have photos taken of it and be distributed yeah. on media channels. It's not real food. If you eat it, you may even die because it's probably that's, not. That's good toothpaste, food. not vanilla ice cream. <laughs> yeah, what, <laughs> yeah. you're, what you're see, what you're seeing is toothpaste that is supposed to look more delicious. It, the texture is supposed yeah. to look even better than real vanilla ice cream. It's shinier. Yeah, the fake thing is better than the real thing. It's shinier. It's puffier. It's, it's slippery. You spray the tomatoes with shellac so the water beads on it perfectly. That that's why that's that's why meta language and mythology is so good. And and again, it goes back to this sense of of um, what the, the mythologist has to do is to denaturalize that which the myth intends to naturalize. We we need to reprove and recontextualize the relationship between signified and signifier as a as historical material contingency, and not to naturalize essential aspect. Because why? You, you see, bourgeois capitalist ideology naturalizes everything. It naturalizes the relationship of people. It naturalizes the accumulation of richness. It naturalizes economical human behavior. It naturalizes the relationship of power. It naturalizes democracy. You see, it, it naturalizes everything. So in the sense that even the myth of democracy, and, and if you want to, if we can take the step into talking about the, light, the, the left and the right, Lenin couldn't care less about the left and the right. For him, the opposition was between capitalism and communism. He didn't, he didn't speak about left and right. Speaking about left and right is already a subjective posture or a subjective positioning within liber liberal ideology. So, of course, both are myth because both they, they start from the mythology of human individuality, of human self-agency, of, uh, you know, like uh, you know, justice, natural rights. You know, all this naturalized aspect of reality that becomes myth, it can only produce myth. Because it's meta is meta referencing itself. 
So whatever you produce, it cannot aspire to reference the real world because it's only referencing that which was naturalized in an anterior myth. So do you want to get into the myth of the, well, I could just say it, the myth of the bourgeoisie is that yeah. the bourgeoisie does not exist. That's the purpose of, course, of because... all of this. The entire mythic structure is to, to pretend that this is a world without classes. That's the entire purpose of it. Nat naturalized differences. Well, well, let's instead of instead of does not exist, let's let's talk about how it is named because that's sort mm. of the idea here. Like when the tree is named by the lumberjack, right? The 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 lumberjack is speaking the tree. Lumberjack is dealing with the trees. It's almost it's almost Heideggerian in a kind of way of coping with things. But uh, but. Yeah, so then the bourgeois, the name of the bourgeois, it becomes ex-nominated, as he says. It loses its name. So what the hell does that mean? What the heck does that mean? Right, right. so there, there is a bit of a, a historical story here in, in the sense that the bourgeoisie is, uh, emerged in a historical period and came to power. You know, it, it used the concept of nation to overthrow the aristocracy and French Revolution, blah, blah, blah. But then it, then it, after that phase, the next phase where the bourgeois were kind of the dominant, it moved into this situation where its name then started to fade away. Its name became mm. just a memory. It didn't want to name itself anymore. It doesn't have a name. Like like the tree. <laughs> if you have a name, you're you've already lost. You're dead. Yeah. Which is why he says there's no bourgeois party represented in a republic because they're all bourgeois parties. Even yes, even the communist party yeah. is a bourgeois. We, party. we have nationalist <laughs> parties, he points out, but no bourgeois parties. If you participate in bourgeois democracy, you are bourgeois. That's it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, and there are national parties though, and that th that lingers on because the the idea of the nation state was kind of the way that the bourgeois, mm. like that that was the ideological move, right, to tie their fate to the fate of the nation state, right, and and. What could the aristocracy say against that? You you have you know divine right of kings. You have we are the cream of the crop kind of arguments of the aristocracy or whatever. Like we have the king on our side. We're better people. No, that doesn't work anymore. With the nation state being the ideological center of discourse now, being like moved into the center, which is an ideological move, not a meta linguistic move. A meta linguistic move or a meta language kind of move like myth makes would then take nation and mythologize it make it natural and that's what happens once nation becomes naturalized bourgeois disappears because it's no longer needed and no longer names anything is the point right yeah so it doesn't exist <laughs> as pills kind of said in the beginning there i just want to uh I, I want to flesh that out a bit well it doesn't exist because it's everywhere that's kind of yeah yeah point. it's a, it's ubiquitous it's culturally ubiquitous and it's not really anything it's a it's a fragment of ideology kind of as he calls it right? it kind of reminds me of the way that um no like there's no no one um who people will argue are neoliberals call themselves neoliberals like there's yeah like in academic circles yeah. there's no position that's actually called neoliberalism like like there's no defenders who will say like oh i'm a neoliberal, I'm a neoliberal. like yeah. that doesn't exist <laughs> Yeah, true. But but then people point to who the neoliberals are because obviously they don't want to say that. It's a lot like bourgeois being neoliberal. You don't want to say it. Exactly. Right? You, you don't want to say that you're a you're a market fundamentalist. Exactly. Everyone is a neoliberal. So. Yeah. You don't need to say it because everybody is one. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's. You assume there's a market fundamentalist. There's a market fundamentalist. Everybody is until they prove otherwise. Because that's just no, what I expect. <laughs> I know, but I don't want to know, so I don't know. This must have yeah. pissed some people off when it was written, because in, in 1957, I think the P Communist Party was still like the second or third largest party. They had a, a quarter of the vote. And he's saying, uh, you know, they're just they're, they're a mask for the bourgeoisie. And it's yeah, not to say I should, we should stipulate not every myth is bourgeois, but all the necessary mm -hmm. ones are. So it's a good place to to start looking like the, the myth. The left has myths, too. And for him at this time, the only one he mentions is uh, Stalin, like a, a, mm -hmm. a pr yeah. are connecting communism with Stalin as an individual, as a as a, a cult of personality. That's a, a leftist yeah. myth, but it doesn't really matter because yeah. it's powerless. 
But what did yeah. he say about the left there? Didn't he say, well, because most of the time, like, uh, revolution can't be a myth? Like, did I misunderstand that? I was just like, what is he talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think, that, man, this was a jarring, uh, it was a jarring sentence to read. But, yeah, revolution is the only anti-myth. But you have to be doing oh, like, it. You have to be, You like, have to be doing it, right. If you're it, not talking yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. Almost like the perpetual revolution. Yeah, almost like if you're actually engaged in a strike, then it's not mythic. But if you're talking about being engaged in a strike, like we do on Twitter all fucking day long, then you're doing mythology. Yeah. Right. Is, is the difference between the thing in hand and referring the thing? Yeah, yeah. I, I look at it even at Lumen, right? It's like the difference between hetero reference and self reference, mm. right? Meta language is language that talks about language, right? That's why it's meta, right? And whereas language proper is about things it's about yeah. well it, it's about signified concepts separated from the things that they would refer to if we were speaking yeah, but but then again the, then again i cannot get off this feeling that uh, all language is kind of meta language if we take roland Barthes seriously oh because yeah yeah for sure because myth does not differentiate between yeah. different codes right so you have a, a written a verbal like if you yeah. asked me how how's your day today and i got out a sticky note and wrote my answer on it and showed you you think i'm really fucking weird but in a myth right you can switch you can do the rebus thing i heart new york you can you can because myth is retroactive right myth yeah. myth takes already formed meanings and just crams them into an arena and then colonizes them with a concept a new intention, as he says, it gives them an intention that's not sort of from their history, right? The, the mythic concept has its own history, blah, blah, blah. But but yeah, so myth, myth does not differentiate between, let's say, substances, right? As, as Helmslov would call them, different signifying substances like verbal language, mm. written language, pictorial language, whatever kind of language you want. Myth but does not distinguish. On that point about revolution, like when it's happening, kind of being real, it's interesting. I've been reading um, Mary Laponti's Adventures in Dialectics. So like the very last, the epilogue, he kind of talks, he reverses what he argued in Humanism and Terror. And he makes kind of a similar point where he says like, uh, oh yeah, revolutions are true as movements and false as regimes. Mm -hmm. Meaning which, when he's talking about the fact that like revolutions always kind of end up degenerating into like some stability that then becomes counter-revolutionary and it's just yeah. like kind of an unavoidable truth and i think like there's something to that that like when the movement's happening that's like the only time it's actually happening and then like as soon as you try to turn it into a regime you turn it into something it's, it's over it's not revolution anymore and then that's you, you stabilize you... it well if you take yeah, exactly. the consequences of this seriously there's no such thing as a leftist youtube channel there's no such yeah. thing as a leftist streamer there's no such thing as a leftist podcast because all of that, he calls it a mask. It's just masking the bourgeoisie by putting it on Spotify, on YouTube, on Twitch. Where it's 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 serving as entertainment to distract from the the yeah, actual the, history. They're kind of meta language, right? They're they're talking about the left. That's the left like us <laughs> in a way. We're the left talking about the left. We're doing meta language here. Yeah, isn't but it? but but still, the way he refers uh, the the antagonism he places between light left and right in this book is still liberal. Mm -hmm. it's still liberal like the subjective position that he's taking to define left and right is liberal he says he's doing that too yeah it's it's individual he's an in, he's kind of individualistic yeah he says yeah. as soon as so, the left so, is named you're just dividing up liberals from each other exactly exactly because like if we take historically there's probably three ways to divide the birth of left and right is uh, young hegelians and old hegelians which is one one way to take it very philosophically serious the people that sat, sat on the right and the left after the French Revolution, and the court of Cadiz, the birth of liberalism in Spain. Those, those are the three ways you can, you can trace back the origins of left and right. But if you talk about Lenin, Stalin, and communism, it has nothing to do with left and right. Eh? Then, the, then the difference be, 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 it becomes idealism and materialism. What political realism, what, what political materialism has to fight is um, political idealism, and political common sense in, in a way that I think the right posture for us to take is the materialistic one is, is not, is not to say there is an, because when he refers to the left as, as a critique of the, the myth of the left and, and you, okay, what is the myth of the left? Okay. So progress, justice, equality, like those are all myths. 
Those are all myths. There are layers within layers of meta language that were naturalized. But then when you take it seriously as a mythologist and try to deconstruct the naturalization of said concepts and you say, okay, so why equality? It's equality as a, a universal common trait of, of, of human behavior. But then Mark will say something like uh, to each according to his need from each according to, her, to, to his ability. So equality is not, is not really a thing we're striving for. No, well, maybe in the left, but not in materialist politics. You see, like uh, I, th I think the, the job there is to, is to take this reading from when he's talking about the myth of the left and the myth of the right, he's talking about both specters of liberalism. They're both, ideo they're both ideological in the way they build their political speech. Because again, speech is depoliticizing myth. Because when you talk about equality, gender identity, affirming a subjective position versus what you expect of, out of justice, those are all ideological positionings. They're not materialistic. They're all ideological. So, of course, there's, there's, that's mythology. It's not, it's not real politics. Yeah, he says straight up, there's, there's one language that is not mythical, the language of man as producer. So it's, it's exactly. labor and labor material. only. And I should say, material, yeah, that's yeah. that's materialism in the sense of historical materialism, as in the sense that the proper direction is that we make nature into history by producing yep. things, right? But the the false way that myth mythologizing works is that it turns history into nature. It takes mm. things that are historical and contingent and turns them into eternal and intractable Essential. truths. And you can you can imagine how if you're somebody who has has say you're you're not heterosexual, for instance, right? Just one example among many, right? These kinds of myths can be very very stifling for you. All right, mm. because they don't accept they they call you unnatural, which Correct. is absolutely absurd, right? That that heterosexual sexuality is is just the natural eternal way of things, right? And I mean, who's to say like you can't argue that on a factual basis? So I could say, well, a very small percentage of living beings are actually bisexual in this way, but I mean, okay, but what about humans? Okay, that's the way we've always been. It's myth, right? So it becomes very important to to uh, uh, de demystify the myth, right? As opposed to sort of accepting it. But but when you are a myth reader, you know, when when Barth does give you these three kinds of reading of myth, right? You have the myth maker, you have the mythologist, and then you have the myth reader, the one who sort of mm. takes the myth at face value. And he says that this is the person who focuses on the mythical signifier as on a whole. It's a whole now of meaning and form. If you, if you heard the other week's episodes, I explained meaning and form are basically the starting point of myth, right? And, and that's, that's mythic signification. And so I receive an ambiguous signification, Barth says, and I respond to the constituting mechanism of myth, to its own mm -hmm. dynamics. I become a reader of myths, end quote. So we have to look at this person who's, who's receiving the myth, the viewer, the average myth <laughs> imbiber, right? In order to see how myth kind of works in its dynamic, socio-historical movement, even though that movement is a movement of naturalizing and eternalizing and essentializing, we still see that myth has this trajectory and we can look at it historically and do an ideological, historical materialist analysis, or we can look at it synchronically as Barth prefers to do here, look at it synchronically and do a metalinguistic critique. Hmm. Those are the two options you have. That's why he says mythology is part ideological critique, part sort of metasemiology and you can't really get out of it either right it's like there's the there's the myths that we'd like to have i think equality mythic or not pretty pretty good goal tolerance mythic or not pretty good goal but what he says is you can these are all produced by the board by, the by those bourgeoisie and you can borrow them but you can't produce your own yeah. And and that's it. Or everything, yeah, everything yeah. every myth must borrow from the bourgeoisie myth and the global capitalist blah blah blah. blah. The and, bourgeois and since, myth almost mm. creates the revolution, right? Like the bour the bourgeois he says necessitates, no? Yeah, yeah, it's the only resistance that they actually ever encounter is the revolutionary party, right? Yeah, the mm. the, the revolutionary party in in Russia or wherever, right? The revolutionary party. But 
you know, after the revolution fails and, and we all kind of, we all, we become the left. It's like revolution yeah. becomes the left. The left becomes the myth of the revolution, right? It, the left is a, is a signifier, a mythic signifier here that naturalizes revolution, but doesn't do it. All it does is talk about it constantly, mm -hmm. about how we need it, how it's needed, how we can't wait anymore, but it never does anything. Right, yeah. that's, but that's but you see his criticism exactly. His criticism of the French Communist Party is they sit there, yeah. they sit there with their <laughs> pictures of Stalin, talking Complain. about it and debating in in the whatever what, parliament. Correct, but but for example, let let's let's take equality for for face value for a second. Why do we want equality? Like, if we were to demystify the myth of equality, like, do we expect do we expect people to have? Uh, in independent from their effort, ability, or capacity, yeah, or the, relationship to no the world, no matter how them. strong you are, you lift fifty pounds a minute, no matter what. Yeah. You could be an yeah, old like, lady or a or a baby. Like for example, you, can, you I can I can put in the constitution like all Brazilians are gorgeous and smart. <laughs> that wouldn't change a thing, you know. Like, I was born dumb and ugly. What do you want me to do, man? It's like, like you can impose <laughs> that that idealistic vision of the world on, on on me, but that that wouldn't change anything. Like in the sense, equality is born dialectically out of the resistance of inequality. Like, oh, the Brazilian equality... butt lift. That's a good myth. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but you see, equ equality it's it's dialectically necessitated from the monopoly of the bourgeoisie on meat. Why? Because of the myth of meritocracy. You know, oh, true. The, 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 the unspoken, unnatural myth of meritocracy necessitates for the struggle and revolution for equality. I like it. But is equality a natural, universally desired good? Of course not. It doesn't make any sense. W once you take it out of a historical context, it's completely empty of, of meaning. You know, it, it is only meaningful and, and as is much is is necessary because the current material and historical conditions don't provide it. But it's not like, you know, like uh, tribes of homo, of homo erectus were like, oh my God, we need to be more equal. <laughs> it's like, what? What are you talking about? Does not make yeah. any sense? Yeah. Uh, uh, David Wengro and David Graeber were doing a yeah, bit of yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, demystifying yeah. In, in, of these sort of myths of history and equality and liberty in their book, Dawn of Everything. Yeah, you can yeah. look at it that way, definitely. And if you demystify equality as a as a concept its purpose was to take down the aristocracy and had a historical purpose it had a use case they used it and now it's yeah it's bourgeois invented or its purpose was to yeah. assimilate critiques coming from outside of europe into the enlightenment uh, according to dawn of everything <laughs> The indigenous critique of the Europeans was then sort of internalized as the myth of e equality yeah there you what go. about the myth of democracy we can speak about greek democracy they were not very democratic. And what about French? Like, you need to have a certain amount of money to vote. And then women are not allowed. You know, and, and still today, there's like a, a lot of ballot impediments for people to actually vote. So what about the myth of democracy? You know, like all, all these universal Athens, values. Athens, the birthplace. All these universal values that sell themselves as essentials are just like a bunch of bullshit that were naturalized. I mean, they don't even care if you vote now because they get to pick the candidates beforehand. You know, the, exactly. so I'm sounding conspiratorial, but you know, the they, but it's true. the bourgeois, it's the true. bourgeois, they get to pick the candidates in advance. But see, when you say when you say that in a cynical way, you're you're like doing uh, Barth's number one reading almost. Ah, like you're looking true. at it as an empty signifier. You're 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 observing how the concept fills the form. You're you're reading it like a like a skeptic, or as he says, the journalist who starts with a concept hmm. and seeks the form for it. So you say, I I want to convey French imperialism, or I want to convey how great democracy is. How what signifier should I use? And it doesn't really matter i can get like a rainbow coalition of of races and make them stand behind me like politicians are always doing when they're speaking yeah yeah i could wear some kind of like yeah i could wear something i could do so, like whatever the signifier doesn't really matter cuz cuz it's the it's empty it's empty you just put a form in it uh, just like you know french imperialism so what why why is the right more successful in doing myths than the left? Oh, we just if need to go to, to the, the next section. Part. Thank yeah. you for that trans. He says this 
Statistically, myth is on the right. There it is essential, well-fed, sleek, expansive, garrulous. It invents itself ceaselessly. The, the right's the natural state of things. The, in a way, the right has an advantage because myths become more stable the more layered they are. Because it takes longer for you to get from the level of the discourse to closer to the real object of reference. And in that sense, mythology in the right, it's building upon itself in an accelerated way. And the left, it's almost unintentionally trying to, because you see, to be a conservative is to conserve, is to preserve the state of things. So you want to naturalize reality and, on, on, and ontology as much as possible. A conservative wants stability, stability of ontology, stability of language, stability of how we explain the world to each other and, and the results of the relationships that we have to each other. So a conservative is building myths and the myths become stronger by repetition and the fact that they become more and more natural and essentialized. And the left wants change. So in order to change, you need to produce different myths or to change or, or to deconstruct the existing myths. So in that way, it's almost like the, the right is adding more layers upon existing mythology, and the left is trying to de-layer existing mythology while at the same time to build a new mythology. Equality is natural, progress is natural, you know, justice is natural. They're just trying to build a different myth where the right is saying, no, injustice is natural, inequality is natural, meritocracy is natural. Those are the natural things. And since we already have many, many years in advantage, we already have those myths in place because we have plenty of stories to repeat those myths. The individual hero, the hero with a thousand faces, hero journey. We already have those myths in place for centuries. And, and the left, in a way, is trying at the same time to deconstruct existing myths and potentially build new ones because they're, they're ideological as well. They're not materialistic. And the right is just building layer upon layer on existing myth because they want to conserve the currently existing ontological view of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Because, well, because that, that wanting to conserve, it just seems, I mean, I don't want to, it, it seems like it just kind of follows, right? Because the left is the myth of the oppressed. The oppressed make the world. <laughs> the oppressor yeah. who, who, who's oppressing the oppressed is the one who's in power. So naturally, they want to conserve the status quo. They won't want things to change. It almost seems like a, it almost seems like a no-brainer the way it, it falls that way if you're concerned for the state of things and you want to see stuff that go better. <laughs> you know, you hop on the revolutionary left side. If you're, if you're somebody who would prefer to align yourself with abusers and oppressors, and, and, but you obviously don't see them that way. You see them as powerful individual people who are asserting themselves and, and succeeding. And you want to align yourself with those kind of people, then you become conservative because they need a yep. stable arena with many, many people who are dispossessed in order to you know bring their plans to fruition, hire people, make stuff, get rich, right? So you want to conserve the status quo because change is dangerous to that situation. It makes yeah. sense to me. But then myth on the right becomes the myth of the oppressor in a certain way. His language, as Barth says, is plenary. It is intransitive, meaning it, it doesn't, it's, I don't know what the hell plenary means. It's just everywhere. It, intransitive means it doesn't take objects, right? So it's not an object language. It's just a language of language. It's gestural. It's theatrical. It is yeah. myth. It is seductive. Right? So he, too. It's eternalizing this situation of, you know, the working class and the owners of the means of production, for example. If we, if we still have that structure in our society, which I think we do, then obviously somebody who's benefiting from it wants to, you know, align with it. And but the, the the sad truth is that many people who support the right are not seeing any of the benefits of this activity yet. For psychological or social reasons, they are aligning themselves with that because they have some, I don't know, some kind of attitude towards the world that makes that more congenial to them. I don't know. And I think it's because doing historical analysis or material taking a materialist approach to history, it becomes very hard. It's time consuming. It's nerd shit. Whereas if you are just trying to conserve the status quo, all you have to do is point at a group of people and go, those people are out of control. Yeah. They are going to take your jobs. They're going to make your kids gay. 
And it's very yeah. easy to right just- Right now, immigration is making houses expensive in Canada. It's immigration, Doug Ford says, as he says every fucking time he Can talks I, about it. It's very easy if you just have to reduce the world into good and evil and then point out the evil. That's a very, a very seductive has, strategy. Has nothing to do that his green belt, belt opening plan is shit. It's because of the immigrants, of course. I have a conceptual clarification question. So I'm noticing when he's talking about myth on the left- at uh, near the bottom of 146, <clears throat> he talks about how they're therefore the one language that which is not mythical, right? So he's talking about one language, but like, and then he says, this is why revolutionary language proper cannot be mythical, right? So it's, so he's talking about how like you can have a language. And I think the way he justifies it is like, wherever man speaks in order to transform reality and no longer to preserve it as an image, right? So somehow that's not mythical. Now, earlier I thought we were, we said that it's only like actually doing revolution, like the act that's not myth, but like talking about it is myth. Um, but he seems to be saying it's not. But then on the other hand, based on what I just heard you guys talk about in terms of the right, it's like if your language, if, if the only if the only criteria for your language not being mythical is that you're using it to create something um, that like affects the material world, couldn't you also say that the conservative by using these myths to stabilize reality, right? To not make people act. Is that not also a creative act that's materialist in a way that is also like not mythical insofar as it's insofar as you want to preserve what exists, right? You want to make sure that it stays the way it is. You're like creating, you're, you're, you're speaking, you're using a language to make something real, to, to, to preserve something. To which one are you giving agency? To the material world or to discourse? He, he says revolutionary language proper cannot be mythical. So what does that mean? Yeah, it, what, it, what it means is that that was the question. What, who, to who are you giving agency in this relationship between uh, change? Is the, is the agency in discourse or the agency is in the material world? Well, that's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering what Barth means here by, by the fact that like... like revolution? In, language. In revo revolutionary revolution? language. There's no such thing as revolutionary language. Well, then what the hell is he talking about on page 146 at the bottom? I think he means, he doesn't mean language as in speaking. I think he means language as in doing. Like the strike. The strike is a form of speech. You okay. mean this, Victor. He said, there is therefore one language which is not mythical. It's the language percent. of men. Men as a producer. Yeah, yeah. Men as a, men as a producer is a language of doing. Yeah, so, so are, why are conservatives not also doing that? by talking about like how they want to keep shit the same. <laughs> Again, because why? Because their discourse is produced by the current existing material conditions, which is already the dictatorship of the, of the, of the bourgeoisie. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, they're doing something. They're conserving the currently existing relationships of power. They're doing it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Like myth, myth can flip into like revolution can easily flip into myth. Right. And that's when it becomes the mm. left, when the left becomes the party of revolution, but doesn't actually do revolution. Right. That's that's when it. So it, like, again, anything can become can become myth. But I guess the language that is not mythical is this sort of what I kind of characterize as this Heideggerian almost conception of of language that where you're you're dealing with things but he's like man as producer you're dealing with the world you're dealing with things you're speaking things rather than speaking about things in in a meta language sense right so well, it's interesting guess, the way that he says that it's it's interesting the way he says that like this kind of non-mythical speech is speech that is fully um that is to say initially and finally political Right. So it's like and not like myth speech, which is initially political and finally natural. So like somehow that like so that's another thing that I was like a little unsure about. It's like wh like what makes speech political, like well, properly remember, political. He, he defines political as the whole of human relations in their real social structure and in their power of making the world. That's how he defines it, right? So he almost defines political as as making the world, how we co-create the world together with one another. And that so that's a creative process. It involves, you know, history and, and making and naming things, right? We name new things as they come into existence and we deal with those things. We speak those things in our relations with one another. It's almost it's like it's an almost a non fetishistic kind of conception. It's a yeah, non-essentialistic it, approach to language. What he's saying is that meaning itself is contingent. There's no such thing as essential meaning. Mm -hmm. when, when meaning yeah, that's a better way to put it. Yeah. When, when meaning becomes essentialized, it's a myth. 
But then, but then, how do you know when speech is actually becoming fully political, right? So, like, well, because 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 it's deconstructing the mythology within it. It's contextualizing the creation of meaning within contingency. Okay. Victor, he's also quite skeptical about like how successful this can be. At the end, he's like, the fact we cannot manage to achieve more than an unstable grasp of reality doubtless gives the measure of our present alienation. We constantly drift between object and its demystification, powerless to render it whole. It whole. So we're kind of a little bit stuck in this, and I think he's taking a one step in that direction, but he's by no means like assured of the success at the end of this path. Okay, so maybe so maybe he's talking about so he's kind of saying, okay, if there is non-mythical speech, it would be this, but then later he's like, I'm not even sure if that's possible kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's where I was okay. seeing him almost moving towards, you know, like the idea of like simulacrum or something, right? Right? Like there's really only the second order and the first order is almost like something we I don't know, pause it underneath it, right? Where, I don't know, but but this sort of, you know, the reason left the left doesn't have myth is because, you know, or the le it's inessential is because it we don't need the myth of revolution for bourgeois society to function properly. It doesn't need revolution, right? It it, it does encounter this kind of the through the revolutionary party, but when it subdues it, it just becomes this sort of the left thing that is everywhere today and nowhere really effective, right? That's why we're always complaining about how disorganized and ineffective the left is at, at countering these sorts of things because what we're dealing with is myth on which is diffuse and non-localized and really difficult to even know it when you're seeing it right and so i mean the left kind of falls back into this you know non-revolutionary meta language position i guess is what he's saying here and that's characteristic of i think the french at this time as as Certain French theorists are breaking away from the Communist Party. They're seeing the whatever the Stalinist atrocities that were coming out in what was it the fifties or whatever. Uh, yeah, they they were seeing this stuff. They were break and they were looking at you know the left is now a kind of you know corrupt, complicit kind of phenomenon. So it's myth in that to that extent. But the, we we have to get back to the productive language, maybe somehow. But I don't know how, and I don't think Barth does either. He does say the the poor, the oppressed, the colonized, they have to deal with their immediate means, their non abstract relationship to the world only. So they don't have time. They don't have the time and luxury to be able to produce myths, which is why left myths are always weaker because they have no power behind them. And he says the speech of the oppressed can only be poor, monotonous, and immediate. So if you're talking about something like, uh, I don't know, healthcare reform, you, you don't have time. You can't mythologize your inability to get healthcare. But the bourgeoisie can mythologize healthcare into something like, you need freedom. You need to have the freedom to be able to choose your own doctor. Better healthcare is private healthcare. There's a myth for you. Yeah, I mean, I found that a little, I, I was just reading that section again, too. And I, I mean, yeah, like to some extent that makes sense. But it's like how many people are oppressed to the point where they're literally only like talking about their like immediate stuff. I mean, it's just like and, and I also think about no, the that's way the that point. They can't are, speak. Yeah. Uh, people like us who are privileged enough, we get to speak, but we are just now becoming the left and, and, and giving mouth service to the oppressed. But still just functioning as a mask for a bourgeois mythology. But if you want to ask a question like, where are these people who are oppressed? Well, you look at where your food comes from. You can look at where your phone gets made. You can look, you know, yeah, well, at I guess the so. other half of the world that isn't outside of our front doors. I mean, that'd be a good place to start. Yeah. When you think that there's like almost a, how many, how many millions of people are kind of starving, say don't get enough food every day. I mean, that, well, yeah, that's, that's the that's, most extreme version of of not being able to like uh, get. Well, by, that's kind right? of what food, food malnutrition is one point four billion. Yeah, yeah though, so that was that was what I was kind of getting to. Is like is like that's the, this planet. this definition here is like I think really applies to like, you know, like by this definition, would anybody in Canada really even count as oppressed? Uh, I think it's it's when you you align. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, but but. <laughs> 
Canada is a is a heavily colonized country with with many people who've fallen through the cracks of that. But let let's yeah think about aligning yourself. Right? It's like okay, we're the left. We chose the wrong side, of course. We chose to we chose the oppressed instead of to the oppressors. <laughs> What's our myth? Well, our myths are ineffective because the oppressed don't get to make myths. Right? We only get to you know get told what how to look at the world, right? That's what the bourgeois does. It's myths kind of proliferate and and they they dictate how it is between humans and the world, right? They they put these norms onto the masses, say, the oppressed. And the oppressed doesn't have the tools to combat that. So its myth is impoverished because <laughs> the left has literally sort of chosen the impoverished side, and and we, the privileged left, have regressed into our meta language position, where all we do is communicate about communicating about communicating, and sending leftist messages, and that's all we can do. Because what what am I going to do? Am I going to talk shit about my employer? Am I going to talk about the next strike that might be coming up soon? No, because that'll endanger my job. I'm not going to do that, <laughs> right? It, that would be. That would be a social suicide, which is not the best thing to do, right? So I, I don't know. It's it, it's not the most it's not the most uh, 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 amenable to myth making when you're aligning yourself in that way. I think, but like I, I, I said earlier, to... when you align yourself the oppressor, then it's much easier because all you have to do is just hop on some right wing network that's probably lavishly funded, and you get myth out your ass. You get myth yep. up to your tits. I think I think going back to Victor's comment in the sense that um, I think most people are actually trapped in mythology, in the sense that what most people talk about on their everyday life is is mythology, and of course, as you said, Victor, mythology here sounds very much like ideology, in the sense is is those things you don't know that you know, mm -hmm. you know, are those things that are operating on a level explaining reality to you. And you, you believe in them, even if you're not fully conscious that you believe in them. Like, for example, you believe that effort will bring you better economical results. You, you believe in it because the myth is there. You, and, and, and everything reflects and builds upon this myth. You know, the struggle, the grind, get up early, yeah, you know, yell American at yourself dream. at the mirror. Exactly. Kick yourself in the nuts, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, like all this bullshit that clean your room, like all this, all this bullshit <laughs> is built upon the myth of a meritocracy. So I think most people are are operating on the level of myth. And, and even on the level of myth, they justify their position in the world. But that's why I think it's fair to make the same criticism to the left and the right. Because in a way, both speeches are mythological in the sense that they're non-political, in the sense that they are not addressing the real material political and foul power forces that create those structures to begin with. They just operate on the level of myth. You know, the right is on the myth of meritocracy and individual merit, and the left is operating on the myth of individuality, identity politics, and, and, and progressive agendas. You know, they're, they're both mythological. When none of them is talking about, you know, and who's going to buy a house before you die? Ah, none of you. Okay, that's awesome. You know, keep talking <laughs> about aliens and 20 genders. That, that's going to be great. That's going to be do, that's going to do wonders for you. Yeah. Yeah. No, let's let's keep talking about the, the left and the right. And, you know, all these myths where in the end, we're all, you know, you don't have land. You don't you don't have a tree to refer to. No fair, one can buy a fair, house. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But let me push back against the leftist myth that there is a real left, that if we were to only speak about those things, then it wouldn't make a difference either. Our podcast could dogmatically be committed every week to only talking about material conditions. And we just call each other out every week for moving into abstraction. But the point remains that discussing historical materialism has literally the same effect as discussing sports. They're both nothing. Historical materialism is almost all of the time its own marker or its own sign in discourse that is you what's it used for i don't know to differentiate the real left from the champagne socialist left but we are all bourgeois subjects we're bourgeois subjects you don't get the option to pick that no one gives a shit that you are in an anarchist discord okay if you are in a discord you are a bourgeois subject which is not to say you're bourgeois of course but you're ranting 
while paying rent to the bourgeoisie, as are we currently at this moment. I am paying rent to a dentist from a family of real estate developers, and they don't give a shit how many times I say I'm a Maoist. I'm still paying them for the privilege of saying it in here. Yeah, yeah. and look exactly. look at like... Yeah, I Going guess back. woke. I guess the wokeness thing is another kind of leftist myth, right? It's another yes. maybe version of the revolution myth. And obviously, like when you look at it in in a certain way, it's fine, right? Yeah, equality. Yeah, people shouldn't be harassed for their sexual orientation and their choices Agreed. of how they express themselves. O fucking obviously, with all of that <laughs> stuff. But it becomes like it. It becomes, you know, these these things we deliver, say, new genders, right? We that that's kind of a creative act, right? And that's and, and that is precisely the material that myth works on, right? Because when a meaning arrives fully formed, that's where myth can take off, and mm -hmm. so you get the anti woke. And you get this sort of reinvigoration of the right, the myth factory on the right becomes, uh, again, it explodes into action in order to mythologize the woke movement and turn it into some kind of, well, I like it. I like what he says, myth operates the inversion of antiphysis into pseudophysis. Exactly. It takes, exactly. It takes what is not nature and turns it into nature, uh, pseudo nature here, <laughs> pseudophysis. Wait, zero so simil. Again, yes, you have the unnatural natural distinction there. It's not a huge leap to think of, well, if heterosexual is being being that as natural, then being all these other things that woke people are pushing is unnatural and we should combat it, right? So yeah. it, like you can see how any kind of revolutionary movement is just kind of coal in the in the right wing myth making machine. Wait, so 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 is so it's a right wing myth then, right? It's not a left wing myth. I was thinking about it being a left wing myth though, and it kind of I was thinking about this earlier when uh, Pills, I think, or maybe it was you, Eric, described like how the bourgeois, like it's myth. It's a myth in the sense that like uh, no one believes it or something like that. And I was thinking about how like well, like on the left, it's like there's this kind of push to be like wokeness doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. It's kind of like uh, pretend. There's nobody a can, bit of an, nobody nobody a self identifies. identifies as a woke. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. a bit of an interplay <laughs> there because now we what do we do? We we do land acknowledgments. We we add these sort of ritualistic phrases into our speech. We put our gender pronouns in our Zoom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we do these sort of things. Those those are kind of little fragments of of mythological. In, uh, uh, what are the, it was, he calls them almost intentions here, right? We take the intention of the myth and we just find the signifiers to match it again. So we say, okay, I want to be left. I want to signal I'm left, so I'm going to do a land acknowledgement. I want to signal I'm left, so I'm, I'm going to switch between he and she when I'm using second person pronouns in my writing, right? Like it doesn't... It, I totally do you that. You can signal it in various ways, but then what it becomes like so. There's an interplay, of course. Like things can sort of go back into myth when they're created, and and then you can sort of see how it works on the left, going towards the impoverished, oppressed side, and you can see then how it works on the right, going towards the oppressor, uh, strongman style of of hmm. being in the world. I guess now, now is the, that seems to be what characterizes the right. <laughs> Yeah. So I think I think like for example, using natural and unnatural are the wrong categories to address meaning. In the sense that that's why I like contingent. In the sense that natural and unnatural keep you on the same axis where you're yeah. looking for essentials. In, in and in a way, what 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 should be done to demystify language is to look for the contingent conditions for that meaning to emerge and have historical stability. You know, like uh, Victor started asking a question, but why myths? Okay, it, it could be bag of flies, but no, but nobody will uh, uh, nobody will endorse it. You know, the the word myth itself as a myth already has a chain of signifiers that gives it enough stability so that when we speak about it, it appeals to this uh, commonplace of again Aristotelian rhetorics that we can endorse it and then we can build upon it. But it cannot be completely anything. You know, like because it will create, it will be unstable or it will not last. That, that's why I think unnatural and natural are the wrong categories and contingent is the right way to address the, the emergence of meaning. The emergence of meaning is contingent and how that meaning remains stable is what makes it interesting, according to me. Yeah, because I think, yeah, when you, when you, I think naturalization 
automatically kind of implies things that are unnatural, whereas yep. things that are historical are contingent, they're created, they're part of the hum the history process. of the human race, right? Like the yeah, the production process and and how we create our world together, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's still a major motif, right? Like I'm pretty sure the dawn of everything, just to even go back to it, says we make our world in the beginning, right? Like it says, we created the world and we can make it differently, right? That is a a motif. I found it interesting when he says, because this is if you if you enter the the political discourse today, it looks like oh, it's left versus right, like these are two equal sides. And he goes, you know, there's there might be leftist myths like the Stalin myth, but it's completely inconsequential. He's not going to even go out. He goes after the French Communist Party a little bit, but basically says if there's myths on the left, they're incidental. There's no left wing myths about uh, marriage, about the home, about the family, about law, about morality. And this is kind of a smack in the face because it sounds like, well, if we listen to the discourse, of course, the left has things to say about all of those different things. But in his in his idea, the left is just borrowing from the center, the the uh, bourgeois liberal myth, and then redeploying a few of those things selectively. But they're not making anything. And again, they're not making anything because you don't have the luxury. As insofar as they're aligned with the oppressed and the poor, they don't have the luxury of of myth making. Yeah, because we do. I guess we do have meta language. We should say meta language and myth aren't exactly the same thing. Like second order language is where myth kind of takes root, takes hold, but it's not everything, right? Because you have, again, you have ideological analysis, which is a kind of second order again, uh, and you have mythologic mythology is 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 a kind of critique of this myth myth process. This like meta linguistics is the critique of meta language. Ideology is the critique of of ideological closure. Of, of historical materialism critiques the ideological closure aspect, and yeah, mythology, metalinguistics critiques the sort of naturalizing function of myth, right? But naturalizing goes against what the left stands for. You, you know, you don't like when you look at a situation and you say this needs to change. Then the last thing you want to do is essentialize and naturalize what's happening, right? So it's almost like what myth does is just simply incompatible with the goals with the of left. the left. I agree. But and also, so I, have, I, have, I, I was I have, just going to say when when we were talking the other week, I think a few weeks back, we were talking about this. Do, does the left need myth, myth? Like, do we need mythologizers and storytellers to mythologize the left? Here, the answer would be no, because that's not possible because of the whole structure of this whole situation. Yeah, that's just to put on that's, a mask. That's why, I, <laughs> like yeah. us. We're not outside of this critique. The, the the critiques he makes of the French Communist Party are like directed at us sitting around talking. Yeah, I totally want to include us in what he's saying here because it's like, no, we're not we're not above this. <laughs> I know, but him too. Like he's not escaping this. He's a uni professor no. at the Sorbonne or whatever. So. Oh yeah, he's the most. He's the most. He reads for pleasure, right? Like his his it's the theory of the text, the pleasure of reading. Like he's a total fucking esth esthete, you could call, right? He's an esthete. He's obsessed with aesthetic analysis, right? Which is whatever. There's been critiques of that later on. And he wants to give like full independence to the writer. Yeah, like, at the very at the very end, he stands for like this full independence of the writer, so that he can full, uh, freely explore uh, the creativity of language without being accounted for, accountable for. And I think the, the what. Deleuze and Guattari would say about this is that this is linguistic imperialism. Barth's method in, implies linguistic imperialism because of what we said earlier, right? Myth, myth homogenizes language. Myth takes all the different yep. codes, written, oral, gestural, all the different ways you can communicate, and it just mashes it into one pool of material that it draws on, right? Yep. So actually, Barth's method of, of mythological critique actually implies a kind of mis linguistic imperialism, which means that everything is expressible in language, that nothing, nothing is impervious to being, ex no, no meaning is, only myth deforms meaning, not translation, not differences between, not code switching. That doesn't, 
it, it, for Barth, this myth that de- deforms meaning. He's placed the deformation in the wrong place, according to this linguistic imperialism critique. And he's going to subject himself to that critique later when he writes The Death of the Author, because his mythologist at the end of this book has this kind of special mm-hmm. position of being able to read everything. And then when he goes into a theory of textuality, that authority kind of dissipates, which leaves us in a more depressing situation as the quote unquote left. Hmm. That, that's what that's why I think like in the end when I was reading like the, the the myth of the left and the myth of the right, I come back to this notion that the left is at its weakest when it's moralistic and idealistic and it's and it's at its strongest when it's truly political and materialistic. Hmm. Like that, that for me is the, when you, when you speak about uh, mythology and ideology, the, the left is at its weakest. When you, when you talk about real, po- real politic, you know, real politic, and you talk about the material conditions and, you know, the people and having the nature in hand, then, then you're doing something worthwhile. Or when you get off your podcast and go join a picket line. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I think picket line today is, is more, is more, how do you say, uh, is is more acting out than Theatrical. anything else. LARPing, yeah, I, I, live action. For the, for the no, it's for the it's free food playing. and the free food and strike pay. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick, picket lining is is role playing. It's cosplay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Revolutionary LARPing. cosplay. Yeah, leftist LARPing. LARPing. Well, I don't have an image. Yeah. I don't have an image to to offer you as what would be called revolutionary speech, except for a picket line. So even the fact that that's so, what you call it, uh, thin, is it yeah, banal very. today. Yeah. It's like, it's do, we cha- do we change the world by striking? <laughs> oh, you can change God. your work. I don't, th- I you don't change your health I don't think that was true in the 50s. I don't think it's true today. Like, I, I don't think, I don't think uh, it comes from striking, really. Well, if you can get health care that you didn't have before, there's a material condition changed. Yeah, yeah. it is, but it's not revolutionary. In, in yeah. a way, for, uh, uh, the acceleration, accelerationist critique will be that it, that will perpetuate the current existing inequalities for longer. It will give you a sense of placebo of change, but it will not necessarily fundamentally change the relationships that symmetries of power. Uh, the means of production will still be in the same hand, even if you have healthcare. So let's just podcast then. It's gonna be yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's do podcasts that's, that's, on YouTube. Yeah, I mean the revolution will come from Burkina Faso and from like Africa. I, I don't think we'll we'll be the ones. Eh? I don't really think we'll be the ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what he, his first thing he points out. That's interesting with um, picket picketing because inoculation is is the first um, sort of uh, dynamic of this naturalization or this pseudo physics pseudo physics of of myth. And he says that um, one immunizes the contents of a collective imagination by means of a small inoculation of mm. acknowledged evil. One thus protects it against the risk of a generalized subversion. This liberal treatment would then not have been possible only a hundred years ago. The bourgeois good did not compromise with anything. It was quite stiff. So it's like, it, yeah, you it, small acknowledged evil in the situation protects against the risk of a generalized subversion, which we talk about, you know, a general strike, right? We talk about a general strike and our little particular strikes, though, are, are you know, if you look at what the press is saying about when you're out there striking, uh, they're saying they're talking shit. They're calling strikers greedy. They're saying they're ruining the economy. They're acknowledging they're acknowledging the evils of this strike left and right. Even though these are people with families and probably having trouble paying bills out there, just trying to get higher fucking wages and and like get their fair share of the fucking work they do. Even I, I would even extend that to the writers in Hollywood right now and the actors too. Right, most most actors in Hollywood are not Brad Pitt or Sandra Bullock. Right, they are just they are gig people hacking it out from job to job, right? So obviously they want better stuff. But this is evil, right? Because it's fucking with the economy. You cannot read an article written in English about these fucking strikes without it mentioning the impact on the economy. Oh, my God. Los Angeles's key industry is, is being paralyzed the job creators. by these greedy fuckers, right? Like, oh, my God. Like, so you can inocu- easily inoculate against these leftist movements, <laughs> right? And then again, all we can do is then fall back into our leftist myths and just complain about it and and write a book called Mythologies and write an awesome afterword called Myth Today. <laughs> 
you can have free healthcare while we privatize uh, all the oil in the land, and then you're going to be very happy about the healthcare. But guys, I have to say goodbye. I, am, I start my next recording in 10 minutes, and I have to prepare well, stuff. It's a good place to end anyway, I think. Woo! Yeah, yeah I think we've run out of steam. Critique has run out of steam. Our, our critique. <laughs> our critiques run out of An steam. An even more radical critique of critiques. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Since you find the next one. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thanks, guys. And Diego, thanks so much for coming on. I know you have a gold, a gold YouTube uh, plate behind you, but do you want to do you want to point our our uh, listeners anywhere? You mean to my channels? No, don't go there. It's a shithole. <laughs> 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 no, please. Well, you're, talking about your, you're talking about your English language channel, right? Uh, uh, yeah, well, my English, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a shithole, but in English. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. pretty much the same. No, but hey. guys, you can, you, if you can invite me more often, I will be very, very, very happy about it because okay, I, I miss your faces. I miss these conversations. You guys are super nice, super kind. Conversations are always super fun and the, the readings are interesting. So whenever you want me back i'll be back oh, well I think you have an open it's always invitation. a pleasure yeah, yeah it is the same. always right. a pleasure all right signing off later, later guys later